Hey, everybody. How we doing? It is, uh, it is Sunday, November 15th. It is lovely in Southeast Georgia, around 60 degrees. We're due for uh, a couple days of halfway autumnal weather, which is uh, my favorite. So I am I'm quite happy about it. <clears throat> it's nice being out here uh, on the porch with y'all after a long, uh, another long week. But aren't they all long? It's um, it's been a lot. We, uh, we've been going through a slow-moving, unbelievably stupid half-assed coup. Meanwhile, uh, coronavirus is just running rampant all across the country. We have a president of the United States who uh, doesn't care, doesn't even begin to care. I'm starting to feel pretty certain in this prediction that uh, Nick and I have been making on the muckrake. Uh, that he's going to go to Mar-a-Lago for either Thanksgiving or Christmas and just not come back. I, 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 can, I can see that. I, I, I don't know at this point that I see him resigning, but I can definitely see him taking off for Thanksgiving or Christmas and just letting everything go and not attending the inauguration, not having the regular meeting with Biden, anything like that. It feels that feels really likely at this point. Yeah, he conceded. He said that Biden stole the election, and and I love though that we've gotten to the point with this fraud that we've gotten to this place with that fraud where we're we're happy with that that he sort of admitted that uh, he lost the election. That's just terrible, isn't it? Just terrible. But it's been one of those weeks. Uh, I keep saying we um, we got to enjoy the victories. Joe Biden has handedly won this election. I live in the blue state of Georgia. Greetings from the liberal stronghold of Georgia. Oh, man. Feels good. Feels really, really good. Um. There's a lot to talk about tonight. I'm, I'm glad that y'all are here. I uh, want to talk Red Missouri with the Blue Bruises. <laughs> I think that's right. I, I think we're all pretty bruised at this point, but I think I think some states are more bruised than others. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about tonight. I'm excited and um, ready for it. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, a lot of questions to get to, and before we get to it, uh, because I want to talk tonight about what we do going forward. And, you know, obviously, obviously we're still living during the Trump administration, but he's a lame duck. And we have to make some changes in how we deal with Donald Trump, how we approach Donald Trump. I wrote a little bit this morning about what I've been thinking about. I'm going to expound on that a little bit more tonight. But it's time to start figuring out what we want to do and where we want to go. And it's the it's 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 time to it's time to start dealing with these problems in a larger, more ambitious, effective way, is what I'll say. Because there isn't there isn't all that much time. I think what um, I think what this weekend showed us is that there is uh, still an absolutely um, toxic, poisonous, fascistic movement in this country. We And I have a lot of questions about this tonight. We have to talk about um, how we're going to beat that and how we're going to overcome fascism and Trumpism and why we have to. And I, I want to talk about that tonight. So there's a, there's a lot of big conversations coming tonight. And I think that's important. And uh, I think I'm going to talk about politics in a different kind of way this evening. 
then I've talked about it in a little while. And I want to talk about, <clears throat> I want to talk about what I think the right way forward is and not just diagnosing the problem of the moment, but talking about steps and things we can do. So I want to talk about that before we do, I, I, I have a cheap plug and I'm so sorry, but I'm excited about this. Uh, tomorrow night, 10 PM on vice TV, uh, the documentary mini series that I filmed a few months ago and I had to go and travel during COVID. I actually missed a, a bourbon talk one night because I had to go up there. I'm very excited about it. It's called while the rest of us die and our good friend, Jeffrey Wright is narrating the damn thing. And it's basically got everybody in the world. I'm so excited about it, but it's tomorrow night, 10 PM. It's a six part series. Um, that is about how uh, the, the powerful and the wealthy have created a system to take care of themselves uh, and, and, you know, basically means that they're not worried about us. So that starts tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Fair warning. Fair warning. It was in the part of the pandemic where I still hadn't uh, been able to get a haircut because it wasn't safe and there was nowhere to go at that point. So I have pretty shaggy hair. I'm just letting people know that I have pretty shaggy hair. I have these old wings in the back that I used to have in graduate school back when I was just a shaggy grad student. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot, but I'm really, really excited. Uh, and I hope you'll, you'll tune in. I think it's, I watched the first episode and it's really good. And I'm so glad that it's on TV. I can't believe vice is like airing it, to be honest. It's pretty subversive and uh pretty damn cool so that's tomorrow night 10 p.m but i want to talk very quickly before i get to the questions about what i'm doing and what i think that we need to do uh you know donald trump has spent the last five years of our lives uh co-opting our attention and just sort of leeching off of our addiction to spectacle our media's insistence on spectacle and it's a massive problem and we have to change it because he's not going away. Uh, I, I don't know if you saw it. I've been predicting for a while that he was going to end up on some sort of network and he was going to be an anti-president. Newsmax has already offered him a show. Uh, I keep saying I expect him to behave like a president in exile. Uh, and that's going to just absolutely wreak havoc on our discourse. I, I mean, he's, he's going to talk about everything period, all the time, every possible issue, he's going to be an anti-president. And it's going to be even worse because there's no consequence whatsoever to what he did. So, or what he does or what he says. So we have to change. And this is really hard, but we have to change the way that we consume news. We have to change the way that we interact with Donald Trump and the way that we allow him to be in our lives. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm refusing to, to play any role whatsoever in the palocentric stuff anymore. I'm not going to talk about, you know, whether Jared Kushner has his ear or Ivanka has his ear or Donald Trump Jr. has his ear or this week it's Rudy, next week it's Steve Bannon. I'm not going to talk about any of that. What I'm going to do as a journalist and a, an analyst is I'm going to pay attention to Trump in order to get a better idea of where the reactionary radical right is going. I'm going to pay attention to the way he interacts with things and the way that the right wing ecosystem latches on to what he says. Now, that's not a matter of covering them or giving them oxygen. I'm going to be doing it because they telegraph literally everything that they do this entire time. And, and people are like, well, how do you predict this stuff? And it's like, well, it's obvious. They, they telegraph the whole thing constantly. So when I talk about Trump from now on, I'm only going to be talking exactly. Trump is a symptom of a much larger thing. I'm only going to talk about Trump when it's about the larger thing. When it's about aristocratic white supremacist rot. That's when I'm going to deal with Trump and I'm going to keep a close eye on him. I would say be very, very careful because right now with Trump possibly getting his own show or his own network, he's giving the media what they wanted. 
they want a country where Donald Trump isn't in charge, but they still want Donald Trump in order to gird their ratings and their hits and their revenue. Do not fall into that. We have to change ourselves. This is one of those moments of reckoning, one of those moments of clarity. We just went through five years of this. We have to reject it. We have to, have to, have to change the way that we interact with politics and media and all this spectacle shit. We have to stop. So that's what I'm doing. And that's what I'm telling people that I think that they should do. Because Donald Trump has just absolutely dominated not just the cultural landscape, but he has dominated the national consciousness. They can't work anymore. So I'm going to be paying attention to how it's going to affect Biden, how it's going to affect the Republican Party, how it's going to affect, you know, grassroots nationalism. But we have to let this guy go. And I know that there's so much of it that feeds off of our anxiety and our uncertainty. But we have to do a better job because this guy has figured out short has figured out a way to short circuit the national consciousness and just take it over. And he's not going to go away. There's a, still a possibility he'll be prosecuted for stuff. I do not believe it'll come from the Biden administration. But there's always a possibility the SDNY will or somebody else will. That would be great. But he's not going to go away. And he's going to have a massive voice. And the right wing is all ready competing over who will carry his message. I wrote about this in the Daily Beast. I want to say this week. God knows what time is. But... There's a competition right now over who's going to carry his message, whether or not it's going to be Fox News, which a lot of the Trumpists are completely bypassing, or whether it's going to be Newsmax or OAN or whatever. But the question is, how much room will we give him? And I think that right now is the perfect time to start setting boundaries on Donald Trump, which is we're not going to pay attention to any of these bullshit stories anymore. Oh, I heard from someone around Trump and somebody in Trump's orbit said this and somebody in Trump's orbit said that. All of that shit is just tabloid shit. That's it. It's just tabloid rumors. And we, we evolutionary wise, we're really into palace intrigue and we love hearing the story behind the story because at this point, politics is all about the story behind the story. But we have to move beyond it. We cannot let Donald Trump have the voice and the attention of the American public anymore. We have to move beyond it. And as a media member, I am going to be incredibly cognizant of it. I don't want to dunk on Trump anymore. I don't want to share memes about Trump anymore. I don't want to make jokes about it anymore. This isn't funny. And I know that for the longest time we've been making jokes about him because he's dangerous. And we want to sort of dilute the, the tension of Trump. We need to push Trump out. He needs to become a pariah. He needs to become somebody who lives on the edge of society. And when he yells, let some people, the jokes were a coping mechanism. Absolutely they were. And I totally understand that. It's like gallows humor. It absolutely was. But we need to push him to the edge of society. And we need to not pay attention to him, except for some of us study him. And that way we can understand what they're going to do and what they're doing. And so we can counteract it. So we have to do that. We have to turn away from them in a big, big way. It's the only way we're going to make this society any better. There's a lot of other ways, but that's one of the top ones. All right. So I just want to make that declaration tonight. By the way, I'm so glad people are hanging out every weekend, every Sunday. It just makes my day. Because it's exhausting. This whole thing is exhausting. And it's such a big, giant fight. And I know that y'all have been tired because I'm tired too. And this whole thing has just worn on me. And I'm sure it's worn on you. So I just want to say thank you before we get to this. So we have a lot of big conversations to have tonight. And again, this is going to be a little bit different of a bourbon talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about some things. I'm going to talk about some diagnosing. I'm going to talk about some strategies. Yeah, I don't think he's going to concede. I don't think he's going to concede. I think it hurts his brand, which is the sad ass truth of this whole thing. It hurts his brand. So anyway, thank you. All right. So we got big conversations to have tonight. Some hard truths, some hope, and hopefully some ideas. Because people say all the time, what can we do about this? What can we do about that? I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I've been doing a lot of uh, a lot of soul searching about how I think that we can make things better. 
So let's have uh, let's have a big conversation. What do you say? I've got enough bourbon. I hope you have something to drink, something to eat. Hope you're comfortable. I want to have some big conversations today. Groggy says, if Trump or one of Trump's kids or somebody Trump approved runs in 2024, do you think they will get Trump's white supremacist base worked out by making them feel like the 2020 election was stolen from them and turning into a new lost cause? Yeah, that's what's happening right now. The stolen election of 2020 is now in the books in terms of right wing paranoia. That's their reality. That's never going back. There's an entire group of people who now believe that 2020 was a stolen election. They're going to believe that Donald Trump is a president in exile, an anti-president, and that's going to be part of their life from now on. That's just the sad truth. That is their history. That's where things are. And the Republican Party understands at this point. And, and by the way, Woodford Reserve is good bourbon. Good for, the, good for you. The Republican Party can't win elections anymore on issues. They have no principles. They're not pro-troops. They're not small government. They're not fiscally conservative. They're not socially conservative. Uh, they're not even pro-life. They're none of those things. The only thing they can do anymore is rely on a white supremacist, white identity evangelical base. And they can poach a couple of people left and right. But this is now part of their official doctrine. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of these Republican leaders are going ahead and putting up with Trump. These bullshit stories about how they're doing it to save Trump's feelings, that isn't true. He's a lame duck. He doesn't have any power anymore. The only thing that they need to do is keep Trump's base with them. And who are they going to vote for? A Democrat who stole the election? Are they just not going to vote anymore? Of course they're going to vote. They're going to vote for Republican as long as there's not an alternative. The problem is that these Republicans honestly believe, and Marco Rubio has already been tipping his hand because he's such a dog shit politician. He has no instincts whatsoever. He has no idea what he's doing. He's already tipped his hand what he thinks is going on. They really truly believe they're going to grow their base and that they're going to become, you know, a more pluralistic, diverse party. They're not going to. They're going to continue going down this line. They're going to continue to shrink and contract and fall into Trumpism and fascism. And all they're going to do is they're going to destroy democratic institutions and they're going to limit people's ability to vote. It's the same song and dance. And that's exactly what's happening now. And we need to understand it. That's their only play. That's it. They have no other strategy. They have one strategy, which, by the way, you want to talk about hope? We know what the Republicans are going to do. They've been playing the same tune for forever. That gives us an advantage because we know exactly what they're going to do at all times. They're predictable as hell. And they're only going to go down this road with Trumpism. And by the way, it'll either be Trump or someone handpicked by Trump in 2024. It's not going to be somebody else. I, 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 I would, I'll put five American dollars on it tonight, which, by the way, is good for debts both private and public. No way. They're going to keep going and they're going to double down and double down and double down. Oh, I think there's even a possibility. I, somebody asked, do I think it'll be Ivanka? 2024 could have a primary where you have Ivanka and Donald Trump Jr. both in the primary. But I actually think what would end up happening is if I had to put my money on a front runner right now, it'd be Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson or Tom Cotton, someone like that. Timothy, Timothy, we'll talk about expanding the court here in a minute. <clears throat> Phil, what do you make of Biden floating student debt relief? So I don't know if you've read it, but at this point, <sighs> Biden is telling people that his big plan is to cut student debt relief or cut student debt by $10,000 a person. First off, wonderful. Just I'm glad that we're at least talking about student debt. Uh, as somebody who is still swimming in student debt, uh, sure, absolutely. Relief would be great. $10,000 is nothing. It's absolutely nothing. If you went to a public university, I went to Indiana State University, which, by the way, I had a hell of a good time there. Still love Indiana State. Terre Haute, Indiana. What's up if anybody's in Terre Haute? I graduated from Indiana State in 2005. Graduated from Indiana State with over $40,000 worth of debt. And then... 
I went to graduate school and almost doubled that. And since then, because the government makes money off my dumb ass, it's increased. $10,000 barely makes a dent. Now, I'm one of the lucky people. I've been able to get a tender track job, which, by the way, is almost extinct. I have a successful second career, so I'm at least able to make my payments. It doesn't mean that I'm able to pay off my debt. That $10,000 is just barely a drop in the bucket. So here's the problem. You ready for this? Ready for why it's $10,000? It's because they want to forgive $10,000 so people will then take that $10,000 and buy a house. It's not just because it's a nice round figure. It's basically an investment in a failing housing market. Because all of us have wanted to buy houses. We've wanted to own houses. But we've been laden with debt. It's down payment money. That's all it is. It's not giving people money. No, it's not. But it's supposed to make people feel like they're going to give, have money to buy a house with. But that's not true. That's not going to work. The problem, no, that would be a down payment, not the totality of the house. If you bought a house in, in America for $10,000, you'd walk in and say, congratulations, and it'd fall on you. It's just have a down payment on a house, but it doesn't work. Because I have to tell you, as part of my generation that is laden with student debt, if I got $10,000 relieved, I'd, put that, I'd try and put that in my pocket. Because I've seen the housing market and the economy crash a couple times at this point. The problem is that it's just, it's a little drop in the bucket. It's not big enough. Not even close to being big enough. It's not even in the ballpark of being big enough. And on top of that, I hate to tell you this, and we're going to talk about what, the, what to expect out of the Republican Party here in a little bit. The Republican Party will stand in the way of even $10,000 worth of student debt. They're more than willing to watch this country burn and fall. Here's the honest to God truth. Are you ready for it? We're on the precipice of a major economic collapse. Doesn't mean it'll happen. We can still avert that iceberg. But it's going to take big ideas. It's going to take big, bold, ambitious ideas. $10,000, that ain't it, Jack. I'll take it. I'll happily take it at this point because I'm a person who's drowning in the ocean. If you threw me like a piece of a piece of garbage to try and float on, I would take it. it doesn't work. It's not going to work. We need something bigger because this whole house of cards, she's a shifting, moving back and forth. We ain't going to get there. We ain't going to get there and we ain't going to fix stuff tiny little ideas. $30,000 still isn't enough, but my God, according to my math and my end, and I'm a liberal arts professor, it's three times as much. So here's why I think about the student debt relief. It sounds good. It sounds like a victory. Student debt relief, not enough. It's not enough. And here's another thing. Here's my opinion on this whole thing. The student debt crisis is part of a bigger scam that was perpetuated on all of us. It was, it was sold to us on the American dream, which, you know, we got the math stolen out from underneath all of us. A fraud was perpetrated on us. That's my, that's my honest to God belief. If you want to see this country take off, forgive student debt or at least student held debt. It is absolutely insane that the United States government is making money off of our debt. That's nuts if you really sit and think about it. But I will also say this. And I'm going to add to this later because we have a big conversation coming tonight about plans and things to do. And I will say this. If you don't make higher education affordable and or free, we have another situation coming our way. Another much, much, much bigger situation. I always explain the situation that we're in right now, the crisis that we're in. It's like a bunch of cords, you know, a bunch of cords in your, in your junk drawer. And when you need one of them, you pick it out and it's just a big giant knot. And you have no idea how to even begin unknotting the knot. There's a bunch of knots. And I have to tell you, 
this fraud of higher education, the way that they have charged everybody and the way that they have jacked up prices and jacked up debt, it's a big chunk of that knot. And there's a lot of reasons why it's a big chunk of that knot. It's not just education, which it is. It's not just the eradication and mistrust of science and experts, which it is. We're also talking about a massive, massive, massive deficit of trust between the people who go to college and the people who don't go to college. And that is one of the defining characteristics of 2020 America, Trump and everyone else. It's who got to go to college and who didn't, or who cares about that type of stuff and who doesn't. That's a much, much bigger conversation. And by the way, just while I'm on this subject, we're going to start having bigger conversations, not just on Bourbon Talk, but also on the Muckrake podcast. We're going to start talking about some of these big, giant knots. Because I'm tired of just sitting around sorting through Donald Trump's bullshit. I wish that he would have sorted it out, and I wish he wasn't such a disgusting, broken human. But we're still going to keep an eye on Trump. And we're also going to work on this stuff because these are the big giant issues that, by the way, the media doesn't pay attention to, that don't get the, the, the attention and the discernment that they deserve. This is a big giant problem. Kimmer says, it seems as if the cases, the, the recount and all that, uh, are being lost. It's only sick fans of cult members really pushing these conspiracy theories at this point. There's no merit to them. No, there's not. Uh, the judges are basically laughing at them. Are we out of the woods or are we close? We're close. We're close. So the good news is that they haven't found a judge yet who wants to throw away their reputation for the rest of their lives. It doesn't mean that they won't. Do not get me wrong. It doesn't mean that the Trump campaign isn't going to find somebody. And by the way, I mean, things like blackmail are a hell of a thing. It doesn't mean that they're not going to find somebody who is going to let them go up the flagpole. And I keep saying it. They're just looking like crazy for some way to get in front of the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court could go looking for this thing, they would go looking, but they can't. So we're almost out of the woods. Uh, I'm not going to take a full breath until Donald Trump's out of office. Now, we have larger things over the horizon. And it's starting to become very clear to me, and we'll talk more about this in a second, it's becoming very clear to me that Donald Trump was a precursor to something else. And that when the history is written, this is going to be written as an absolutely batshit absurd time. But Donald Trump is, is going to be written, if we're not careful, as a precursor to something and somebody else. We're almost down the woods. We're really, really, we're, we're getting there. All it takes, though, is one judge or one court and the Supreme Court, and God knows what happens then. But Donald Trump, I, well, I'll, I'll breathe a whole lot better on January 20th. So we're getting there. We're getting there, but we're not there yet. Amy, I'd like a Jared's eye view of Georgia's Senate races, please. Looking forward to hanging with political junkies and tossing one back. Here's to tossing one or two back, huh? Okay, so conventional wisdom in Georgia right now, and I've heard from a few people down here, conventional wisdom is that uh, the Democratic operatives are more confident in a Georgia race than they've ever been before. Um, they are pulling all stops. Also, by the way, the money, <laughs> the money that is flowing into Georgia right now is absolutely insane which we're going to talk about in a minute as well, because we've got another hard conversation that we have to have. Uh, right now, the conventional wisdom is that Democrats are probably 60-40 to take both seats. 60%, 40% no. Um, that sounds about right to me. I, I keep saying, though, that there's a terrible, terrible, terrible tradition in America of people want divided government. So if you told me right now that Warnick won, Ossoff lost, or Ossoff won and Warnick lost, I wouldn't be shocked. I really wouldn't. But as of right now, I would say the smart money is on both of them winning. I, I, I Because I have to tell you, and, and I don't know how familiar you are, and you're going to get more familiar. 
Uh, Purdue and Loeffler are terrible candidates. They're as crooked as the day is long. And on top of that, they're not talented at all. They have nothing going for them. Absolutely, BB. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, so, yeah, I if, if, if I had guessed right now, I would say that they win both seats. But there's a long way to go before we get there. All right, Tom, we're a couple weeks past the election. What kind of lessons can we take from the results? All right, so here's a couple of uh, autopsies from 2020 of what I have noticed so far. Okay, number one, old campaigning is dead. And it's not just because of the pandemic. The pandemic only made it clearer. Uh, I was thinking this back in... um, Hell, I guess that was February. I could be wrong on that. I wish somebody would tell me if I'm wrong on this. But it was back in the South Carolina primary where Biden beat uh, Sanders and he became the de facto uh, candidate. Biden had no like real game in South Carolina. And on top of that, he wasn't really doing much. It just so happens that the political forces coalesced around him particularly based on the efforts of uh, Clyburn, Buttigieg, and Obama. At that point, it became a conventional sort of a wisdom idea. And and by the way, this is one of those things where, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, Lee. I completely agree with that. So one of the things that happened at that point was you actually had an electorate that figured out They were like, okay, well, I'll tell you, between these two candidates, I am voting for the candidate that I think can beat Donald Trump. That was the prevailing sort of opinion that took place in South Carolina. Turns out they were right. It turns out that Joe Biden would be Trump. Whether or not Bernie Sanders would have beaten Trump or not is a different conversation for a different night. But they were not wrong that Biden would be Trump. So what you end up seeing is we have a group of people that right now are voting for candidates from a pundit point of view. And by the way, like you're hanging out with me, I'm sitting on my porch drinking bourbon on a Sunday night at 8.30. We're sitting here talking about the nuts and bolts of politics. And by the way, we're not talking about like surface level stuff. Like we're getting deep in the weeds on this stuff. Like you all are politicos and political junkies and you're interested in this stuff and you're involved and you think about this stuff. We have become a group of independent pundits. That's the way that we've learned to look at politics is we're thinking about the maneuvers and who will do this and who will do that. We've turned into analysts. And so one of the things that has happened in modern politics is now one of the things that we do is we're considering voting based on what we think will win versus the policies that we want. This is one of the big questions that we have to deal with, which is, what does that mean? And what can we do with it? That's that's number one, is that we have a culture that has become fascinated with the minutia of politics behind the illusion of participatory politics. So campaigns have changed. And with that idea, we have to change the way that we campaign. The old campaigns are pretty much gone. Although, and I think it was maybe Lee that said this, the Republicans still went out and knocked on doors, which made a difference in a lot of different campaigns. So it looks like there might need to be a stratified, this is the second election uh, uh, lesson, it looks like we might need a stratified changing sort of a strategy depending upon areas. We are so divided based on locale at this point and based on class. It's such a major division. And it might be you have to do this here, you have to do that there, and you go forth, and, and, and it might have to be like a different type of thing. Well, number three, and by the way, uh, Matthias, I think that social media absolutely pulled back the veil. And I think that that's something that we need to understand is that 
we're not talking about politics. We're talking about politics within politics, right? So some people are voting based on their opinion of how the game is played, which if you really want to get deep in this stuff, go back into the early 2000s and look at reality TV and things like Survivor. I mean, there is the point where the neoliberal ideology has played a role in this, absolutely. Uh, the next part, by the way, which just goes back to it, which is the vulnerable populations like people of color continue to show up and vote because their lives are on the fucking line. There are still people who are voting economically. There are people who are voting for their own oppression. And meanwhile, the vulnerable populations who have to go out and face the danger of fascism every single day are voting because their lives are on the line. Number five, though, is that we are learning the demographics are not completely predictable. One of the things that we saw here is that Trump made inroads with the African-American population, particularly African-American men and Hispanic voters. All of a sudden then you have to realize there's a point in politics where economics trumps race, gender, identity. That's a dangerous thing particularly as we're moving toward a point in America where resources are going to become more and more limited and austerity will continue to go forward. That's exactly right. Kelly said, one of my friends said capitalism is adapting to identity politics, which we have to talk about in a minute. That's a big, giant thing. I have a question about just that topic, and we're going to talk about it in a second. There's a lot of lessons from this election. But number six, which is the final one, and I'll move forward. Number six is that if Donald Trump was not such an incompetent, embarrassing disaster, he would have won re-election. Period. If he would have been like 10% more competent, if he would have even tried to handle the pandemic, he would have won re-election. And that's one of the reasons why, moving forward, particularly from this point forward, we have to understand that this battle is not over. We're going, because here's a problem, and, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more because there's more questions about this. When you have a president in office, we've gotten such a dichotomized society that if the president is part of your party, you have to pretend like the world's great and everything's awesome and that that president is doing such a great job. Now that a Democratic president is in office, there's going to be such a push to believe that things are fantastic, that things are perfect, which they're not. And they're not going to be because major systemic changes need to be made. We have to keep our eye on the ball. We have a fascist movement in this country, and that fascist movement is going to get so much worse so fast. And if we don't recognize that this is an actual problem, it's going to be bad. And Virginia says Democrats don't fall in line the same way Republicans do. I think that's true. But I also think that the Democratic Party is getting ready to have a pretty big civil war within itself. And it's only going to take a month or two of the Biden presidency for it to start. It's going to start when he names his cabinet, and then the first hundred days are going to define this. And when that happens, you're going to see a big clash but the people who are with certain groups or they're with other groups, they are going to come within their umbrella very, very quickly. So there's going to be a lot of stuff happening. Tom, no, Tam, I'm sorry. You posted about strategists wasting donation money. What is that all about and what should we do differently? So this is one of the stories that isn't getting a whole lot of attention, which is that Millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to Democratic candidates basically ended up with just a couple of political strategist firms that, by the way, are there for every election. They have no ideology whatsoever. They make the same damn ads. They all look the exact same. They all sound the exact same. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, I don't have the beginnings of an idea what most of these candidates believe in. I mean, most of them, they don't even like define themselves as a Democrat. The problem 
is that there is an entire industry of people making money off the Democratic campaign circuit. They're making tens of millions of dollars. And that's like this stuff with uh, McGrath and uh, in Kentucky. Uh, you know, you saw this with uh, Jamie Harrison in South Carolina. Yeah, they take 15% off the top of media buys. Absolutely they do. And they don't care if somebody wins an election or not. They don't care about that. They only care that they get paid. This is the deep, dark secret of, uh, of democratic politics. And it has to change. So they said, what should we do differently? And here's the secret. You can donate to campaigns. They absolutely need money to make sure that their offices are there. Ads aren't bad, you know. They have to be able to uh, they have to be able to run a campaign. But I'll tell you who wins elections. That's get out the vote operations. That's registered vote operations. That's Stacey Abrams shit. Is what that is. And on top of that, those ads, those ads, they come and they go. Like, people might remember them, and they're like, yeah, maybe I'll vote for this, or maybe I'll vote for that, or maybe I'll vote for them, or maybe I'll vote for them. You get a true grassroots, get out the vote, register to vote operation, all of a sudden, you start putting together an apparatus for power moving forward. This is the difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party on the ground. The Republican Party gets you and you're going to vote for their people for lives and you're going to volunteer. And by the way, you're going to go out and you're going to make calls and you're going to get more people to come in. The Democratic Party is has this entire strategic operation. McGrath didn't stand for anything. Beating Mitch McConnell, which is was enough for people, which, by the way, she should have beat him. She would be a better senator than him. But what does she stand for? Not being Mitch McConnell. Oh, God, the amount of money being spent in Georgia already, it would embarrass you. It really, really would. And so here's the thing. Why you need to pay attention is because, number one, it's your money. Like, you shouldn't be spending money on these strategists who are already incredibly wealthy and part of a privileged class to begin with. But the other part of it is, if you want to build an actual machine, if you want to build an actual movement, it's got to be grassroots. I keep telling everyone, we got we to gotta stop waiting for all of these people to come and save us. We have to save us. We have to do the work. We have to wear ourselves out. We have to bust our asses to make an actual change in this country. We can't just keep shoveling money at the problem. It helps. But we need to actually find a way to build operations we have to find a way to get things actually done and have power in a way that the Republican Party figured out a long time ago. Which, by the way, a lot of it, a lot of it started with, you know, like Phyllis Schlafly, who would just get all of her friends in, in, a, in a room, tell them what she was passionate about, and then they would stuff envelopes. I mean, she was absolutely disgusting, and she was a total turncoat to women, and she set back, you know, uh, a place of women in this country decades. But, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what puts the oil on the wheel. We got to start doing it, and we can't just throw money at it. We can throw some money at it, and we can donate and all that stuff, but we have to we have start getting involved. And not just in national politics. We have to start winning local elections. That's, by the way, where trust is earned. If you win a local election and people see that you work hard and you're not part of the, the deep state, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, I might vote for that Democrat. I might vote for that independent. I trust those people. I know them. I, I, I live around them. They, they work their asses off. They're real. They're a real person. They're not part of the deep state. They're not part of this conspiracy. Also, by the way, local politics, regional politics, state politics, that's where so many of these laws and so many of the districting things are parts of it. So, yeah, like it, it, it has to change. We can't just throw money at it. The thing about it is they're psychologically manipulating us into doing this stuff. You all got those emails. I got them, too. It's like we're ugh, bad news. We're losing bad news. It might all be over. And if you read those, it's a sense of panic. 
It's not a sense of momentum. It's like send some more money, right? Oh, I'll, I'll name a name. One of the main groups, and if you go out and look at them, it's a group called Mothership. It's the, one of the brand new ones that made a shit ton of money off this election cycle. Mothership. There's some really good reports about this out right now. Yeah, the, the, these strategists, they don't care at all. At all. They, they basically got hired by one person after another. They made a ton of money off Harrison. They made a ton of money off McGrath. Lettuce Mary says, right, that's where I'm at. Oh, no, Tunbach says, if we won't prosecute Trump for his crimes in office, can we get Kushner at least? I, here's the thing. I don't know that all of them are going to get prosecuted. I feel like at least one will. I feel like at least one of these cronies is going to get caught doing some stuff. That's 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 my hope on that one. Let us marry. Maybe it'd be Kushner. Kushner feels Kushner feels like someone who'll end up in prison, right? Doesn't Kushner feel like one of those people that would just have a really satisfying perp walk? That feels right. Like like in the gut. It feels no, Pence is an incredible specimen at being able to like maneuver. Pence can walk through rain and not get wet. Pence is Pence has done an incredible job within the Trump administration staying away from controversy. The only time he even got close was with the Flynn thing. And Trump tried to push him out in front of the coronavirus thing. And and, and Pence just kind of like just sort of went to the back and moved away. It was incredible. Absolutely incredible the way he navigated it. Let us marry. Odds that the Dems will actually deliver on any relief or other moves in a positive direction. The odds are there. But we have to pressure them to do it. The Democratic Party has mostly defined themselves as an opposition party to the Republican Party, which is whatever the Republican Party is doing, the Democrats say, that's not what we are. Or that's really awful and terrible. We're this. We're the opposite of that. Uh, I think the Democratic Party, particularly in a position where they're going to have the presidency, possibly the Senate and, and uh, the entire Congress. Well, that's the question is what will they do? We have to pressure them. We have to let them know what we want and we have to, we have to keep going with it because right now they've got us over a barrel, which is what are you going to do? Are you going to go, go vote Republican? Of course not. Of course not. You're not a sadist. You're not a fascist. You're not going to vote for a Republican. So right now they've got us over a barrel. But we can pressure them. We can exert good pressure. We have two years before we have to start talking about, you know, midterms and primaries and all of that. Yeah, I, I, I think that they can be pressured into doing things. I absolutely think that's true. Doesn't mean it'll happen. Doesn't mean it'll happen. Laura, why don't the Dems tell people about things like GOP tied to Cambridge Analytica and tell us outright about Council for National Policy and others like them? Dems need to get two more need to need to get more aggressive about telling us things like Koch brothers and their agenda. Maybe naive, but people should know. They absolutely should. But the Democrats, for the most part, think people don't know about this stuff. They think most people don't understand this stuff. And so most of the time they appeal to the conscience of voters to say, we're better than this other party. But meanwhile, they don't really have fights about issues. And I keep saying this. Like, most of the issues that the Democratic Party has now fielded itself on, they're not even up for debate. Of course we should have universal health care. The fact that we don't have universal health care right now is a national, international embarrassment. And they can't even make that happen. They can't even make that a thing. The fact that we're having to go out and be like, hey, systemic racism is a real thing. Of course systemic racism is a real thing. Who in the right mind that's right? Because the people who can continue with power will say that it's not real. Absolutely. We're, we should have stimulus. We should have massive work programs is what I think. And I'm going to get into that in a second. What I think the Democratic Party should do and what I think Joe Biden should do. And by the way, what I think that we have to do to curb fascism and, and, and the rising threat in America and save us from, I don't know, things like global climate change and, you know, rising anti-democratic movements. 
Told you it's gonna it's tonight's a tonight's a talk. Last week was a celebration. Last week was a good celebration. But we gotta have a talk. BG Morose. If you see similarities between the stolen election theory and the stab in the back theory of post World War War World War One Germany, what do you think could be done differently now to prevent a similar mainstreaming of far right resentment? Do you think history will rhyme? I think this is going to be one of the major, major, major defining points of our new modern political era. I think the stolen election idea, this mythology, this this conspiracy theory is going to motivate the Republican Party and its supporters for a long time. So what do you do? I think you keep trotting election experts, by the way, are who are <laughs> Democrats, Republicans, bipartisan, nonpartisan. I think you keep trotting them out. I don't think that you have reach across the aisle fest where all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's an interesting thought, Senator, the election was stolen. Perhaps you'd like to come on my Sunday morning network show, which is bullshit. We don't need more articles with Trump supporters in diners. You know why? Because they're just repeating lies. There's other things we need to be doing. There's a lot of different things we need to be doing. They're fascist. We need to start dealing with the actual conditions and not the illusory conditions. So how do we deal with it? You call it a paranoid conspiracy theory, and you point out that the Republican Party has been peddling paranoid conspiracy theories for the last 30 years. You just say it. You say it. You stop, you stop, you know, tiptoeing around the fact. You call it. And by the way, when you call fascism fascism, and when you call conspiracy theory and paranoid shit, conspiracy theory and paranoid shit, Here's the thing, you kind of have an advantage because the truth is on your side. And when people hear it called out the way that it is, as opposed to, well, I know people have a lot of concerns. And blah, blah, blah. When you start doing that, when you start actually calling things out by their actual names and the factual truth of the matter, things work out. Stop paying strategists millions of dollars to tell you what to say and go out and say, we're tired of this bullshit. Because I'll tell you what Donald Trump taught you. When you come out and you talk in a faux authentic way, it works. So talk in an actual authentic way. Go out and call it paranoid, white supremacist, pandering bullshit. Stop playing around with it. My God. <sighs> Absolutely absolved. How is Trump's fascism similar or different than previous well-known nationalist, fascist, ideologues, dictators, evils? On the flip side, do you see any concerning power philosophies among socialist or anti-fascist fascist unity organization? No, there's nothing troubling with anti-fascists because there's not really anything besides a group of people who go out in public and tell fascists that they're not welcome. Which, by the way, thank God they do because we just saw a few thousand fascists go out in the streets and beat up on a bunch of people and stab people. So we have an actual fascist problem in this country. The difference here, and what is becoming clear, is that Donald Trump is intuitively a fascist. He doesn't have an understanding of fascism. There's no way whatsoever that Donald Trump could give you a working definition of fascism. The actual fascists knew what fascism was. They were able to articulate it. They wrote books about it. They, they were able to educate people around them about it. Donald Trump is a fascist because Donald Trump is a fascist. It's not because he believes in something. He intuits it. It's who he is. He is a white supremacist, bigoted fascist. Authoritarian. Throw whatever you want. It's all true. The problem is that Donald Trump isn't the only fascist in the world. There was a fascistic movement in this country that he took advantage of. I tweeted about this the other day when I was talking about the wrestling idea. He played in public like a populist flat, a fascist. He knew all of the right uh, keys to press, like a piano. He knew exactly how to get to these people. He knew how to talk to them as a fascist and how to arouse their fascist ideas. That should scare the shit out of everyone. That there's enough of a fascist movement in this country that a guy 
could just come around and intuit how to radicalize them even further. That means that they're ripe to be radicalized by people who actually believe this shit and understand it. That's the frightening thing. But here's the truth. Fascism takes place in countries that believe themselves to be exceptional with the nationalistic pride and the nationalistic mythology. It starts coming up when capitalism starts to fail. When there's a crisis in the country and capitalism ceases to work, fascists rise and capitalists help them rise because they do not want socialists or, or liberals to gain any sort of traction. So what happened in Europe is now happening here. The difference, and this is becoming increasingly apparent by the day, is that Donald Trump might be the precursor to an actual authoritarian who can consolidate fascistic control. Right now with this coup, if a couple things broke his way, absolutely, we would have an actual coup. They would have worked themselves into a coup. But it looks like now that he's the precursor to something else. Cotton. Possibly a Cotton. Possibly a Tucker. Maybe somebody we're not even talking about right now. Okay, so I have a cluster of two questions together. I'm going to answer them together. No more war. Actually, I'll answer them separate. I think they both deserve it. No more war. Best case and worst case for Biden. Best case. Uh, Biden manages to find a way to bridge the, the main wing of the Democratic Party with the progressive wing and sell those policies to the American people and make them incredibly popular and curb an economic crisis and change the trajectory of American reality, which is a big, giant order. The worst case is that he gets in and the Republican Party continues their old Obama rule strategy of just deadlocking everything, hurting the country intentionally, and causing him to be a one-term president and pushing us further towards a climate catastrophe, a fascistic uprising, and an economic collapse. That's the worst case scenario for a Biden presidency. Or literally everything that he tries to pass gets swatted down by the Republican stock Supreme Court. And after four years, and by the way, again, we're on the verge of an economic collapse. We have an ec uh, a climate catastrophe coming and fascism is rising. So after four years, we're just closer to all those things. That's the worst case scenario. So this was a good question from uh, Trump is Fasis. You're an advisor to Biden. What do you tell him? So here's what I think. Here's what I would do. And here's what I think needs to happen. Now, whether or not the next four years or whatever look like this is a different story altogether. But here is my unvarnished truth. I think you go big. I think you go really, really big. Because I think what's missing in this country is a vision of what tomorrow can look like. I think we've been caught up in America trying to look like it, it did in the 1990s for 30 years now. I think that we've lost the ability to imagine a better future. I think that we have forgotten the possibility of transformation. And I'll be honest with you. I think that we are on the verge of a major catastrophe. Uh, and this goes back to the economy. This goes back to... Uh, the climate, and this goes back to fascism. So we, I think we need to recognize that we either define the future or we let someone with worse intentions define the future for us. So here's what I would do from the very beginning. Um, I would do something that would be immensely popular. I and, and, and I keep telling people this because I come from a factory family. I come from middle America. I think that one of the biggest failures in America for the longest time was to get rid of industry without figuring out something that people could do for some sort of an alternative. I would do a major works plan where you start investing in industry for uh, alternative energy. 
whether or not that's windmills or solar or whatever. I, I, I would I would just flood middle America with it. By the way, we've got 10 seconds, so we'll get back to my plan to save America. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So here's what I would do. With that work program, it would do a couple of things. One, it would actually be something that starts to uh, address that starts to address the conditions of actual life in America. So what that would do is it would be incredibly popular in middle America and it would trouble the stranglehold the Republican Party has over them. Because all the Republican Party does is tell people, these are the people who are hurting you, hurt them. At this point, you start giving them an economic incentive to vote a different way. All of a sudden, that moves the Republican Party in the direction of trying to find solutions. And what they would end up doing is they would realize this shit was actually popular, and they would have to start negotiating, making it less big, right? That way that they could get their hand in the pot as well. The other thing that this does, and this goes back to uh, FDR's plan, the New Deal didn't save the economy in, in, in totality. The war was what ended up throwing America into, into overdrive and actually saved us from the depression. The New Deal got a bunch of young men who could have become fascist and made them invested in the country. And at that point, what ends up happening is you have a bunch of people who could have joined a bunch of fascistic groups and been dangerous and angry and violent and it got them out in the country working on things and it made them feel yes they cut funding way too soon and that was the other problem is that the republicans they nobody talks about this but they 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 kneecap the new deal immediately after the war and that's part of what the red scare was all about we don't learn all this stuff but it's true so all of a sudden you start taking a lot of young men the people who have like the blue lives flags, the people who have the Punisher skulls, the people who, you know, are out there possibly joining the Proud Boys or joining militias. Suddenly they're going around and they're invested in the country. And on top of that, they have something to do besides sit on a coon and hate on people. And so what ends up happening is that you have a reinvigoration of America. And by the way, that also plays another game. It says to the Supreme Court, the stolen Supreme Court, what are you going to do? So is the Supreme Court of the United States of America stolen by the Republican Party? Are they going to shut down a program that would help millions upon millions upon millions of Americans? Well, I have to tell you, if they do that, and, and I keep saying this, if they were to strike down Roe v. Wade, which I actually don't think that they're going to do, I think they're going to flirt around with it and see how it feels. And they're going to strip it down until it's still there, except for most people still can't get abortions in certain states. If they strike something down, all of a sudden, the political reality of the Supreme Court changes. All of a sudden now, Biden's like, I don't know, everyone. I tried. I tried to help people. Seems like maybe we should add some Supreme Court justices in order to make it reflect the will of the people. Supreme Court knows better than to go down that road. And at that point, you're moving pieces around a chessboard. You're reinvigorating America. You start taking climate change seriously. And by the way, people will take climate change seriously if they get a, if they get a paycheck to fight climate change. That's one of the biggest problems that the Democratic Party has missed out on is that people have a hard time believing things that they are paid to disbelieve. So if all of a sudden they're working in factories, they're creating windmills, solar panels, all these alternative means of, of, of fighting climate change, all of a sudden they're going to believe in climate change real damn fast. So that's what I would do. But I have to tell you, we don't do this if we don't do something big if we just continue to 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 play footsie around this stuff 
we keep rearranging the chairs, oh my god, it's going to get so bad. And we're going to talk more about it here in a second. We have a couple more questions. But I want you to know, this is where I stand. And this is what I think. I think you reinvest, and I think you call America into a crusade against climate change. And, 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 this, and that will take care of the fascism a little bit. It won't get rid of it. It won't get rid of it. But it takes a little bit off the top. And every little bit helps. And, and all you have to do is look at history. And you look post-Great Depression. And you see that this kind of stuff. Yeah, you're going to fall. That's exactly right. It would help with the opioid epidemic. I completely agree. You create a New Deal scenario. And like the New Deal, you just take a little bit off the top of the fascist threat in the country. And you you hope that it just takes another level off. And hopefully it takes another level off. And all of a sudden the temperature changes and the political reality changes. But you have to think big and you have to be daring. You have to be daring. Ray. There's a schism in the Republican Party. I don't trust Dems to know what to do with it, but the left must exploit the fault lines that present themselves and create a culture where we can win against establishment reps and Dems. Your thoughts on a few action items we can focus on? That. So here's the thing. You just had Donald Trump for four years. You had a group of people who voted for him to make America great again. Yeah, maybe they define themselves as Trump people, but are their lives better? No. Because that's the law is the Republican Party has said, we're for you, we're the party of the working man. They completely changed that entire reality. There's an opening now. Make their lives better. Make their lives a little bit better. And by the way, that makes everyone's lives better. If you can improve the economy in this country and you get rid of austerity, you'll make all of our lives better. And on top of that, we're not going to be shot up as much. We're not going to have fascists marching in the street and stabbing people. Yeah, there's, a, there's an opening right now. You have a lot of people who got played by Donald Trump. They're not necessarily going to come out and tell you that Trump screwed them over, but they're open right now, right now. Vivaldi's Four Seasons Landscaping. It's a good name. It's a good internet handle. By the way, real fast, I just want to state it again. Y'all are the best. Absolute best. Hanging out. We're already at 67 minutes on a Sunday night. Oh, fellow white boy. Oh, that's so sad. You're a right wing troll. You don't have anything better to do on a Sunday night. Are you lonely? I'm sorry. I'm sorry your life sucks right now. It could be better. It really could be better. It's the sad truth. We have a we have a alt right troll. I'm sorry about the troll. I hope I hope your life gets better. I hope all this anger some somehow or another dissipates, and I hope you find something better. <sighs> Sad. You can have a better life. You can be healthier. You can have better mental health. You can enjoy something. You wouldn't have to be nihilistic. It'll be all right. Absolutely love these bourbon talks. I love all of you. Y'all are wonderful. Again, that's what I'm saying. We're, we're like over an hour on this thing. Y'all are hanging out. We're just under 400 tonight. That's awesome. <sighs> Mateels, you were in my class? Oh. Send me an email. We'll reminisce. I always love when old students come by these things. People are wonderful. Anyway, y'all are wonderful. That's what I'm just saying. Y'all are y'all are wonderful, and uh, I really think just to go off on a quick little rant, um, like I I have hope. I know things are hard right now, but I actually have hope. Um, I um, I don't know. I think I think these little communities, I think they help everything. And I think that we've got so much work to do. But I think when we I think when we join together and we find each other and we support each other, I, I, I have hope in that. So I'm just saying it. I'm a little I'm a little weepy ever since uh, we won this thing. It's nice. 
Absolutely love these Berman talks. Thank you so much for Vivaldi's Four Seasons Landscaping. Is there any way a Biden administration could begin to penetrate the right-wing media bubble and bring those folks that consume it back into a shared reality? How do you even start? I, I, I keep saying this, and this goes back to what I keep saying about talking to uh, people who are, you know, brainwashed in this stuff. Um, you, you don't have to talk to them about politics. Oh, another freshman English class. Well, thank you for being here. It's so nice. Um, I think you talk to them like humans, but you don't talk to them about this, um, this bullshit. That's the thing. You don't talk to them about the bullshit reality that they live in. You talk to them about reality. You talk to them on a human-to-human -human level. So I, I have to tell you, there's this weird schism developing between Fox News, Newsmax, OANN, there's going to be people who kind of get caught in between, in that fraction, in that cleavage. They're going to be gettable. And there's a lot of people, again, who supported Donald Trump who didn't see anything get better. In fact, their lives got worse to see, as he got up and said every day, things are getting better, things are getting better. You, Everyone knows things are getting so much better. Well, they're not. Your rich friends, are get, your lives are getting better. There's a reason. There's a reason why... There's this schism developing. The reality is in flux. There are people who are gettable. And there are people, and, and I keep saying this, this whole thing is a mental health crisis. There are going to be people who get help. There are people who are going to turn away from this thing. There are people who are gettable. Not all of them are gettable, but there are people. Purple Sword, talk about the fact that Moscow Mitch McTrader, it's quite a hashtag here from Purple Sword, is holding us hostage and without a continuing resolution. So here's the thing. They don't care. They'll burn the whole thing down. They're engaged in a power play. There's a reason why they sleep well at night while meanwhile they deny you health care. There's a reason why, I mean, we're nearing a quarter of a million people dead from this pandemic unnecessarily. They don't care. They'd be totally fine if this government fell apart and was just stripped bare. Why? Because they have personal wealth, they have personal power, they have personal leverage. They don't care about the rest of us. The country is just a bargaining tool. For people like Mitch McConnell, he's a politician because politics leads to the most power and the most wealth that he can possibly get. They don't care about helping us. They're playing a different game. They've been playing a different game for a very long time. F corporatism. With the Republicans' anti-science agenda, why do they not fear killing family members and friends with their policies? That's that. They would more than happy sacrifice people in their lives. Like, there, there's a lot of these people. I mean, <laughs> if you're worried about your family and your ancestors, why, why get rid of restrictions on pollution? I mean, they're, they're making sure that our food is more contaminated. They're may, I mean, the, here's the thing. Think about this. They know climate change is real. All of the Republicans know climate change is real. Let that sink in for a second. And not only do they know, they've known since at least the early 1980s. The early 1980s. The energy companies, by the way, have known since the 1970s. They knew before the most prominent climate change scientists knew. They've known this all along. Now ask yourself, how do those people sleep? Because they're not thinking long term. The only thing they care about is profit and wealth and power. That's it. Well, so here's the thing. They do care about their own children and their own grandchildren. That's why most of the wealthy and powerful in this country have doomsday scenarios. Most of them have a place where they can run away. They have like these, you know, like... They have, like, bomb shelters that they can go and hide out in. Other ones, I don't know, like an Elon Musk, they think that they're going to escape the planet. I mean, they're, they're living in a fantasy of power, wealth, and privilege. That's the only thing I can tell you. They don't care about you. I mean, if there is one thing that the pandemic did, is it showed us how little they actually care about us. They don't. They don't at all. Reaganomics set up this entire situation. This would not have happened. If they cared about us, there's no humanity in that at all. Henry, 
I heard you mention the term woke capitalism on a podcast. Can you expand on that? Absolutely, I can. And here is a big conversation that we need to start having. And if you've been hanging out for these bourbon talks for a while or the Muckrake podcast, or if you bought American Rule, which, by the way, cheers if you did. Here's one of the defining things that I hope that my work has made obvious. It's that this sort of reality that we live in, this dichotomous reality, good and evil, black and white, isn't real. And that so much of it is based on an illusion that that controls people and keeps people from understanding the truth. Here's what woke capitalism is. Most of the corporations, most of the wealthy people in this country, understand that at the very least, in order to be successful, in order to have people shop in their stores and buy their products, that you at least have to affect the veneer of progressiveness. This is why every major corporation has a statement that's like, we value diversity and, and we do not discriminate based on sex or gender or you know any, any, any of these things. They, it's all this lawyer speak, right? So they know that they can't do that because the moment that they do that, it can lead to big, giant, um, um, you know, strikes against their products that they can't, they, they will not be able to sell their products to certain people. And they have to figure out a way to sell to the most number of people possible. And they do understand. And by the way, this should let everybody know where we're going, which is that they know that the future belongs to progressive ideas. So they at least have to tip a cap to that. That's why even the most racist, exploitive companies are employing like anti-racist to come in and give speeches and lectures and workshops. Because if they ever get, you know, called out for being racist or sexist or exploitive, they can say, no, 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 we've had these anti-racist workshops and all of this stuff. They pay to not get called out for who they are. Again, this is why Nike paid Colin Kaepernick millions of dollars to be one of their faces. Even though Nike is one of the most exploitive companies on the planet. What this is about is that these corporations understand, and this goes back to the idea that corporations are people. They understand because they are all tuned to psychology. And by the way, I wrote about this a lot in American Rule. This goes back to Edward Bernays, who is uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew. They understand that people buy products to express something about themselves, whether or not it's who they are or who they want to be. So this is one of those situations where the purchases that we make, the consumerist culture that we live in, is based on us being something else or or trying to project to the rest of the world who we are. And by the way, like I'm I'm not sitting here immune to it. Like, you know, like if you look behind me right now, there's like shelves full of books. There's art on the wall. Guess who figured out that was a good way to sell bookshelves and that was a good way to sell art? Edward Bernays. It's because I'm an academic and I want people to think I'm smart. That's why whenever you look on MSNBC or CNN and someone's getting a Zoom you know, segment on a show, they have books in the background because they have a psychological need for you to believe that they are intelligent. There's a game being played constantly about who we are and our insecurities and who we want to project to other people. There's a ton of stuff, all right, with all of that. These companies right now are pretending to be progressive so that you, as a progressive will buy their products. This is why whenever Nike signed Colin Kaepernick, a bunch of people are like, oh, make make the alt-right mad, buy a bunch of Nikes. Well, you're actually buying a tennis shoe that is being made through exploitive labor. It's hiding something. It's like when Donald Trump tells a bunch of like people, oh, I'm for you, I'm for the working person. You're like, no, you're not. You're not at all. You're not, you're, not, you're not progressive at all. You're not for the people at all. So what this is, is it creates this consumerist 
reality that has nothing to do with actual reality. All of a sudden, we start having symbolic fights. We start arguing about, oh, I like this commercial, I don't like that commercial. Oh, who got cast in that movie? Who got cast in that movie? And by the way, like, I mean, you have like someone like the Walt Disney Corporation, which has done unbelievable damage to this country. And it's like all of their movies now have little progressive hat tips, right? Meanwhile, the Walt Disney Corporation has spent their entire existence peddling conservative propaganda. There's a ton of that stuff. And meanwhile, it's like you watch like the last Avengers movie and there's a there's a moment where like all of the, the, the females are in like in the frame and they're like looking very heroic. Meanwhile, they had like, I don't know, two minutes of combined screen time before that. It's 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 a nod. It's an ability to pretend like you're something. This is something really dangerous. And the reason I'm talking about this at length is this. We have to start sorting the real from the fraudulent. We have to start understanding what reality is versus what the lie is, because the lie so often is going to be a consumerist sales pitch to you. And when you get caught up in that stuff, you're not participating in reality anymore. When you're online arguing about who gets cast in a movie and stuff like that, you're not having a conversation about representative politics. You're not having a conversation about what the world looks like. You're having a conversation about what the illusion being sold to you is. So woke capitalism is about exploitive companies realizing that quote unquote wokeness or progressive politics is a challenge to them. And this is a big thing. And I, and I hope, I hope you take a few things from this bourbon talk. I hope we've been hanging out for over an hour. So there's stuff to be learned from this. This is a big thing. And the big thing is this capitalism and particularly hyper-capitalism, are incredibly adaptive and malleable. One of the most amazing things about hyper-capitalism is it can identify things that challenge it and then commodify them and then sell them back to you. It's an incredible aspect of hyper-capitalism. It's a big, giant chunk of what we're dealing with right now. And we are just lost in so much of this alternate reality that's being sold to us. So what one of the things that we have to do moving forward is we have to discern the real from the illusion. And if we can figure out what the real is, we can start to affect change. If we get so caught up in the illusion, we're never going to even be able to figure out what it is that we need to change. These are big, giant issues right now. Massive, massive issues. We have a few more. We got we, we got a lot of questions today. Winky Raccoon, what do you think of the Dems playbook is an attempted paragraph coup? I think Democrats are just letting this thing play out. I think they're trying to let Trump, you know, hang himself with enough rope. That's the thing. I um I, I think that uh I think they're trying not to get involved in this, trying not to get dirty with this. I think Biden should mention it more, but that's a different thing altogether. I don't know enough about Yang yet. The universal basic income, it sounds like the beginning of something, but it, it sounds like an invitation for capitalists to sort of put the football down and then take the football away. Anti-greed, give me your thoughts on long-term American prospects. Um, we either reach the moment of crisis and fascists are empowered and then they take over, which, by the way, um, if you think things are bad right now, uh you know, forced sterilizations and, and camps of immigrants and stuff like that, when climate change starts being a thing, when all of a sudden you have climate refugees running from state to state, this red-blue shit is not going to be great. The question is, and this is one of the long-term ideas that we have to look at, which is, how do we get rid or how do we tamp down fascism so by the time that the climate catastrophe possibly hits us, we don't let that be the defining characteristic of our society. That's one of the major, major long-term things we have to think about. Because right now I have to tell you, capitalism, capitalism only survives the more that it can expand. All right? So capitalism is, and, and, and you know, America was in a position where, like, we started out, you know, east of the Mississippi. 
we always had the ability to expand and go out and take native land. That was always something that we could do and we could always outrun our problems and outrun our economic issues and our political issues. Eventually we got to the coast and we could not run those things anymore. Well, what did we do? We started going out and taking over, you know, other countries and islands and peoples. Well, now capitalism has taken over the world. Where does it go? It doesn't go anywhere. And now not only is capitalism not expanding, climate change is going to contract. All of a sudden, you're actually going to see countries start to contract. And then all of a sudden, you take all of those political issues. All of a sudden, you start taking all these like radiating, crazy things, and you start condensing them into a shrinking sphere with lessening resources. Holy God. If we don't get fascism under control by the time that climate change rears its ugly head, woo, woo, that should keep you up at night. If you and, and by the way, I would say this: this is a big thing we got to keep our eye on. We need short-term goals, medium-term goals, and long-term goals. Long-term goals, you need to start thinking about what kind of world you're leaving behind for your for your ancestors. Because, holy God, if it doesn't hit while we're running around the United States, it could be really, really bad. Alfonso, what is the main reason we're dreading conspiracy theories? Because powerlessness breeds paranoia and these, these conspiracy theories that simplify explanations. People are removed from political power, and so they have to explain things in any way necessary that they possibly can. So as a result, conspiracy theories come in. The dangerous part is when the powerful use those conspiracy theories to their own ends, which is what ends up happening with fascism. But right now, people who do not have an education or a language to express what's happened with particularly globalism have been brought into a fascistic, paranoid, conspiracy-laden sphere. That's what's happening right now. Joan Core, with the virus spreading out of control, has your school been open? Yes. Are you remote teaching? Yes. We're in Chicago, I've had schools open, it's bad everywhere. Yeah, um, the problem is that it's political, and in so many of these states, it's been um, it's been turned into a political football, and it's so irresponsible, it's so dangerous and and disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting what's happened with COVID so far. LD, many people seem worried Trump will pardon himself. Uh, would there be a stack of things he could be charged with after he leaves office? I don't think Trump's going to pardon himself, but at this point, if he did, I wouldn't be that shocked. Would you? I wouldn't be that shocked. I don't think that's what's going to happen, but I, I wouldn't be that shocked. Chi Town Packer fan, how do we counter hegemonic right den party led by Harris, Pelosi, Schumer, and even potentially Sanders ranked choice voting? No, I don't think it's going to be about ranked choice voting, and I don't think Sanders is going to uh, get involved here. I, I, I think it's about grassroots uh, advocacy and, uh, you know, organization. Protect the results. How do we deprogram people in the Trump cult? Talk to them as people and explain to them, you know, how the wool's been pulled over their eyes and how they can make more money and live longer, better lives. And truth, truth is a hell of a thing when you actually give it to them. We've got to understand history. And once you start explaining history and you start explaining how all this stuff happens, it's pretty amazing. I have to tell you, I'm doing research right now for a project on the Middle Ages. And for years and years and years in the Middle Ages, people weren't able to read. They weren't able to understand science or history. And then all of a sudden, when they started understanding science and history, woof, revolutions start that way, baby. Sebastian Lima, how can the threat of fascism be de-escalated? Two, is Trump going to have to purposely leave a mess in the White House? There's a massive mess in the White House and in the country. Biden is coming in with a deck completely stacked against him. You better believe it's it's an absolute mess. Again, I think we de-escalate fascism not by talking to the paranoid conspiracy lies, but by talking to them based upon solidarity and, uh, you know, making a better future for them. Elena, have family who are diehard racist Christian Trumpers that do not accept facts even when, when provided by Fox. And my question is, how do I get them to see the light? I think first and foremost, you have to talk to them as people. I think you have to talk to them as people and you have to reestablish bonds. One of the things that ends up happening is we have atomized bonds. And so as a result, people don't trust each other. I know that sucks, but it's true. I think you talk to them and you don't talk about politics until you've reestablished bonds. And then maybe you start venturing into politics and what you'll find. And I keep saying this on all these things. 
what you find is that people get radicalized when their lives are really rough, when they're having a hard time. I'm an immigrant. Most state legislatures are Republican. They'll soon be redrawing political lines. What, if anything, can we do to ensure redistricting lines are drawn fairly? Number one, we have to get involved in local and regional politics. We cannot let that be taken over completely by Republicans as it has for years and years and years. Second of all, we got to call attention to this stuff. There have to be repercussions for these people who are trying to gerrymander. And that's the thing. We have to talk about it. We have to put light on all of the ways that this disenfranchising happens. All right, we got two more. Uh, for Monday, advice on how to wade through the countless theories and projections for how this plays out. No one can predict the future, but with so much noise, how do we mentally prepare for what may come? That is a great question because this is exhausting and overwhelming. I think the only way that we can do it is to educate ourselves. I, uh, you know, it, it wasn't until, and, 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 and I'm, I'm going to be honest here, like, it wasn't until a few years ago that I suddenly realized all of a sudden that, like, the New York Times and the Washington Post, which are more accurate than most newspapers, are still, like, you know, corporate interested newspapers that they have an agenda. It was the same thing with like an MSNBC and CNN. I've been told all along they're left wing. Well, they're a sort of left wing, you know, organization, but they're not. I think what we have to do is we have to go out and we have to find our own sources and we have to find our own information. We have to learn history. And when we learn history, all of a sudden the lens of stuff starts figuring itself out. I'll be honest, like I wouldn't have been able to do these talks or write American Rule, or do the podcast, if I hadn't have, like, re-educated myself. You know, it's it's not like, I don't know, I'm not particularly suited for this thing. I think I'm decent at it, but it was just that I went out and I learned the information, and I was able to start filtering things through a lens of truth and reality. So I think that once we start learning history and learning the nuance of the moment, things start figuring themselves out a little bit. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Kelly. I try and be decent at it. It's a re-education, right? And it, it happens to be in this accelerated moment. There's so much information that it can just overwhelm you and come over you like a stream. But I think if you gird yourself, I think if you gird yourself with actual information and truth and reality, I think then all of a sudden things start making more sense. I have to tell you, this is one of the weirdest moments in American history, and it makes so much sense to me, simply because I know the history and I understand the nuance of what's going on. So it only seems so confusing and overwhelming when you're not able to like parse out those different types of things. So yeah, it's, it's, it's re-education. It's really, really hard. Kate Weber, last question of the night. I've been watching your talks because you bring such transparency. I hope so. Also, compassionate humanity. Thank you. I, I try. Thank you. As a professor, do you slash how do you talk about the election or social issues with your students? How do you try and foster these characteristics in them? So, first and foremost, I have to tell you, I, um, I don't talk to my students about politics, really. I taught a political writing class once, but I let them make their own decisions. Um, and I think that goes back to like how I deal with Trump supporters and, you know, people who are sort of uh, in the throes of conspiracy theories and QAnon and Fox News and all of that stuff. What I like to do is I just like to talk to people about history and what they're into and what their passions are. And so, you know, I have a lot of students. I have this entire weird political career. I don't even know what to call it. Um, and some of them, some of them get a kick out of it. They know what I do. They know what I'm into. And they're very passionate about the same political stuff that I am, but I'm not, I'm not indoctrinating, you know, when I'm in the classroom, like I have students who come through who have, they know that I'm involved in politics, but they don't know if I'm left or right or in the middle or whatever. I don't indoctrinate. What I like to do is I like to talk to people. And when you talk to people, what it does is it disarms this dichotomous trench warfare. Um, what you need to do 
is talk to people about what's going on in their lives. And when you talk to people about what's going on in their lives, you can draw a direct line between that and what they believe. And if all of a sudden you're not just arguing headlines and you're not just arguing talking points, all of a sudden you're having a human conversation. And the, 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 here's the big giant thing is that political power in this country and around the world has been all about maintaining power among the powerful few and the wealthy elite over everyone else. The people you're talking to, I'm guessing, are not the powerful and wealthy elite, right? They're they're not hanging out in the same place as we are, you know? If you're talking to other people, you have a chance for solidarity. You have a possibility. No, I'm not reading this as I'm talking. <laughs> um, if you just talk to another person, it doesn't matter who they voted for, you're you're part of the same group. And when you actually talk, you start to realize, oh, these talking points actually are meant to divide us and keep us from engaging in solidarity and organization. It's a big, giant deal. Just talk to people. <laughs> That's right. In fiction, I, I try and teach people not to use quotes in their short stories so they can have better dialogue that makes it obvious. Thank you, Matthias. <laughs> that is an indoctrinating thing that I've used in my classrooms. That's true. And that's, hey, moms love you. That's a that's a good point. Too angry at the moment. I completely agree. I, I, I find it amazing how quickly the media was like, we trust the aisle, find common ground. No, we just went through an incredibly divisive election. I mean, the right was scaremongering and fearmongering. I... No, I, I, I think we need to take a moment to take a breath. I think that's what this interregnum is between the election and, and the inauguration. Like, Take a breath. Calm down. Figure out what you want to do. I completely agree. We just went through four, four and a half years of incredible trauma. We're in the middle of a generational pandemic that was completely unnecessary. We just went through incredible trauma. Yeah, you you have all the reason in the world to take a breath and and try and, and and heal for a minute, and that's the problem. Is so much of the work and obligation is on us. I agree with that. It's really really exhausting, really exhausting. This isn't though. This isn't though. Um, Y'all are wonderful. I really appreciate you. Always always do. This is uh, one of the highlights of my week. And the fact that you just hung out with me for an hour and a half plus. That's amazing. I can't believe you do that. When I started doing these, I kind of expected no one would hang out. I was, I was kind of expecting, I don't know, maybe like three or four people. Maybe a couple of students. I don't know. Um, just really. Pre the, oh, okay, real fast before we go. The puppy's great. The puppy is a complete and utter little monster. She is just running all the time, biting all the time. Uh, she's lovely, though. I love her so, so much. I was very, very lucky to get her and, and have her in my life, particularly at this moment. Uh, she's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Um, again, just a couple of plugs. No, she's not a rat terrier. She is uh, She's just a little chai weenie. Is what she is. She's part Chihuahua, part uh, Dachshund. You know what? I'm feeling in a charitable mood. I'm feeling in a communal mood. Let me get you a picture of this absolutely ridiculous animal very, very quickly. Hold on. All right. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Look at that dog. Look at that dog. I mean... My Lord, she's like a little cartoon dog. She's like a little cartoon dog. She's like she's like a Petco commercial, and the Petco ad like goes across the screen, and she comes trotting after. <sighs> Crazy. Crazy. The, uh, the original ad, so she was like being uh, uh, fostered for a minute. The original ad describing her is like da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. And the last sentence was... Uh, She's spoiled, but she deserves it. And it's just ridiculous.
ridiculous. Yeah, so I'll bring her to one of these bourbon talks one of these days if she isn't wild. That's the problem. I would have had her on one of these a lot earlier, but she would just be crazy and barking and biting. It is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's too much. It's too much, but she'll be on one of these. So again, a couple plugs. Um, a reminder, tomorrow night, uh, on Vice at 10 p.m. While the Rest of Us Die, the Shadow Government six-part documentary series uh, premieres 10 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, I'm really, really excited about this. I've never, I've never been a part of a documentary miniseries. I've never been a talking head on one of these things. I've always wanted to be a talking head, so I'm a talking head. I'm really excited about that. Uh, New Muckrake comes out on Tuesday. Nick and I are doing a bonus episode where we watch Forrest Gump and talk about uh, movies as propaganda and how history gets warped. If you want to get a part of that, that's a Patreon only thing. That's uh, patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. So watch Forrest Gump before we do that. Um, we have a lot of talk about Forrest Gump coming up. That's uh, quite the movie, quite the movie. Shadow government. Yep, that's right. While well, the rest of us die. And then I think we'll have another one on Friday. So thank you all so much. We have so much work to do. We have so much work to do, but I think we can do it. I really, truly, honestly think we can do it. We beat Donald Trump at the, at the ballot box. Now we just have to make sure that his legacy is a failed president and not the inspiration for a future fascistic movement. And we have to make this country better and realer and more human. That's a lot. But y'all are wonderful. You give me hope. Cheers. Last of the night. Good stuff. All right. See you next week.